right, so Psalm 40, Ephesians 2, Romans 5, and Ephesians 3. And let's pray. O Lord God of heaven, we thank you now for this time with your word. And I thank you, Lord, that we have the Bible, that you've provided it for it and preserved it throughout the ages. And despite all that man has tried to do to it and still continues to try to do to it, it still stands strong. It is still the truth and will always be the truth. Lord, I thank you because your word is exactly what we need each and every day. It truly is our daily bread. And I thank you, God, that it brings comfort, it brings correction, it brings joy, and it helps us through the best of times and through the most difficult of times. Your word is so special and is so precious. And I thank you, Lord, now for this time, and I pray that it would bless you first and foremost. And I pray, Lord, that you would send your Holy Spirit to help us with the understanding and to bring us ever closer to Jesus Christ. And these things I pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen. All right, so Psalm 40, we're going to start it. I'm going to start at verse 1. Psalm 40, verse 1. I waited patiently for the Lord. And he inclined unto me and heard my cry. He brought me up also out of an horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock and established my goings. And he hath put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. Many shall see it and fear and shall trust in the Lord. Blessed is that man that maketh the Lord his trust and respecteth not the proud, nor such as turn aside to lies. Many, O Lord my God, are thy wonderful works which thou hast done, and thy thoughts which are to usward. They cannot be reckoned up in order unto thee. If I would declare and speak of them, they are more than can be numbered. And so Psalm 40 is a messianic psalm, meaning that it speaks of Jesus Christ and provides prophecy about him. And it is not only a messianic psalm, Psalm 40 also provides guidance and comfort for the disciple of Jesus Christ today. And quite often, and I do it myself, the opening verses of Psalm 40 are quoted as a testimony of a person that has been born again. The person is called unto the Lord God, and he has heard them cry. And in crying out, that person has expressed faith and trust in the Lord. And then God pulls him out of the horrible pit in the miry clay of sin and places the person on the rock and directs their going. They now have a new song in their mouth and go forth and praise God. And this will cause others to fear and trust in the Lord. This wonderful passage of scripture is, is used to reach out to the lost because with it, because it keeps the focus on God and what he will do and not on me. The salvation is God's work. I must cry out to him in faith, believing the gospel of Jesus Christ and then trusting him fully. It is not about the benefits of being born again and going to heaven. It is about the fact that I am a sinner in need of salvation from the wrath and condemnation of God and I need the Savior. Jesus Christ is the only Savior. There is none other. And a pers person must believe on his death, burial, and resurrection for salvation. They must believe on him, that he died and paid the price for my sins that I should pay. But he paid it all for me. 
Jesus Christ is the only Savior. There are plenty of self-proclaimed saviors out there, and there have been in the past, and there are now, and there will be in the future, but they too will one day die, and sadly die without Jesus Christ. Verse 1. I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined unto me and heard my cry. Now these opening verses of Psalm 40 are exciting to consider. The Lord God of heaven, the creator of heaven and earth, the one that holds the universe in the span of his hand, is willing to condescend to hear me when I cry out to him. What a wonderful Lord we serve. When you think about what the Lord God has done for you and think about what he went through on his way to the cross and then on the cross, your thanksgiving really should just flow out of you like a rapidly flowing river. And when Jesus Christ was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he prayed to his Father. All through the Gospels, you read of Jesus Christ praying to God. Even as Jesus Christ, in pain, and as he, as he hung on the cross, he still prayed to God, asking him to forgive those in front of him. Jesus Christ prayed that God would forgive those that had beaten and mocked and spat upon him. He prayed for those that sat down in front of Jesus Christ as he was on that awful cross, and they pointed, and they scoffed, and they mocked him. He taught his disciples this in Luke chapter 9. It says, saying, The Son of Man must suffer many things, and be rejected of the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be slain, and be raised the third day. Jesus Christ prayed, and he patiently waited for the Lord to answer too often when we pray, we're not willing to wait upon the Lord. God teaches us patience. He teaches us patience. You know, I had to learn patience this past week. You know, after wrenching my knee and, and having to walk a lot slower than I'm used to and a lot, a lot more carefully than used to, he taught me patience hopefully i've learned but god will do what he can to teach us patience i like this quote it's from the the believer's bible commentary and it says and this is about prayer god's help comes not too soon lest we should not know the blessedness of trusting in the dark and not too late lest we should know the misery of trusting in vain the Lord does hear you when you call out to him. You can be very sure of that. But are you willing to stop and wait? And that's the tough part. You think about Psalm 27, and more than once it says, wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord. Look at verse 2 now. He brought me up also out of an horrible pit out of the miry clay and set my feet upon a rock and established my goings. When Jesus Christ prayed at Gethsemane, he began to sweat blood. And this is a true physical condition that can happen when a person is under an immense amount of stress. The, the, the capillaries, those littlest veins that you have in your body, they'll, they'll if your body is under enough stress, they will pop and blood will seep out. And this was what was happening with Christ. The sufferings of Jesus Christ began at Gethsemane and they continued to his death on the cross. It is aptly described here in Psalm 40 as an horrible pit and miry clay. In other words, a situation that is very difficult to get out of. And it was God that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. 
Romans 6, 4 says, Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ, <coughs> that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. God the Father raised up God the Son from the dead showing that the sacrifice of the Lamb of God was accepted by God, and the New Testament was then begun with the death of the testator. Keep your finger here in, in Psalm 40, but now go over to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Go to uh, verse 4. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. So I wanted to read that whole sentence there, this verse 4 through 7 is one sentence, because I wanted at least a portion of the context to be in there. But what I wanted to focus on was that phrase in verse 5, hath quickened us together with Christ. And to be quickened means to be made alive. When you think about it, before salvation, you were dead in your sins, and you have been, in a sense, raised from the dead with Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ's goings were established by the Lord, and he shows the exceeding riches of his grace toward us through Jesus Christ. That's that goings that is spoken of in Psalm 40, verse 2. But when you think of the further blessings in all of that, you know, have raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. All of that is in present tense English there. That's not down the road. That's now. And so somehow, some way, there's a portion in heaven when you're saved. We have been sealed by the Holy Spirit, but he's saying, hath raised us up together, made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. That's God showing his grace, and he shows his grace to us, but others then see that grace. Others can see what God has done in our lives. God can, people can see how God has blessed and helped even in the most difficult of times. And even if they're not expecting the they're expecting a, a physical blessing or a financial blessing, we get a spiritual blessing, which is far greater because that we can have that peace even as we may be under st stress for whatever reason, we can still have comfort and joy, even in the most difficult of times. We're done in Ephesians 2. Go back over to Psalm 40. Psalm 40, verse 3. Psalm 40, verse 3. And he hath put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. Many shall see it in fear and shall trust in the Lord. You know, and this is one of my favorite verses because, you know, I love to sing. I can't carry a tune in a bucket or a dump truck, but I love to sing. And, and he's put a new song in my mouth. This is a different song than I would have ever sung when I was younger. A much, much, much better song than ever. And he has put that new song, and that new song is that song of redemption. The shed blood of Jesus Christ was the price he paid to redeem your soul and pay for your sins. So your song must be the song of rejoicing in the Lord Jesus Christ, thankful for what he has finished. 
The new song glorifies God and tells of his greatness. Sing of your Redeemer and his wondrous love to you. Now, what was the old song that we sang? It was the song of creation. In Job, we read in Job 38, verse 4, God saying to Job, Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. And think about it. The Lord spoke, and the world was created. The angels sang, and the sons of God shouted for joy at the creation. And everything was good. And it says at the end of Genesis chapter 1, it was all very good. There was so very much to sing about. Keep your finger here again in Psalm 40, but now go over to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. When we think about all that we can sing about, and we'll see in a, in a few moments uh, one of the other verses that just shows us, when you really think, you, you can never run out of things to praise God for. Romans chapter 5, uh, verse 12. So there was so much to sing about at the creation, but sadly, sin entered into the world. Romans 5, verse 12. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Sin and death entered the world through Adam and Eve, and all became cursed. The song of creation had been sung with great joy, but was now sullied until Jesus Christ. Go down to verse 18. Therefore, as by the offense of one judgment came upon, I'm sorry, therefore, as by the offense of one, Judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. Jesus Christ sacrificed his life on the cross and died for men's sins. He brought glory to God by giving his life, giving up his life to pay the debt that mankind owed when Adam and Eve sinned. He went into the horrible pit and the miry clay in order to save sinful man. And as he told the Apostle John, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and death. Jesus Christ arose from the dead. And there is now the new song of redemption for you and I to sing today. Psalm 22, verse 22 says, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. Many shall see it and fear and trust in the Lord. What a blessed thought to be able to do that one day. And it's all, sadly, the sin came in because man chose to sin. But Jesus Christ is what makes the difference. Go back, we're done in Romans 5. Go back to Psalm 40. Psalm 40, verse 4. Blessed is that man that maketh the Lord his trust, and respecteth not the proud, nor such as turn aside to lies. What is salvation? It is to have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and his gospel. It is to trust that Jesus Christ finished the work of salvation while on the cross of Calvary. It is to believe the gospel of Jesus Christ and trust in him fully. To fully trust the Lord means that you will, not, you will also not respect, have respect for the proud and those who lie. 
It is repentance, because you were once a member of the proud and the liars. But through Jesus Christ alone, you are no longer a member. You no longer rely upon your good works. You no longer trust false gods and idols. You are now blessed. You are blessed because you have made the Lord your trust. Ephesians 1.3 tells us, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ is your trust, and you are blessed because of him. Amen. You see that word a lot nowadays, the word blessed. We see it all over the place. And the sad thing is, is that those that, that practice witchcraft and things like that, They'll talk about things like, you know, blessings upon you. And they've twisted God's word. And it's sad. Because they don't understand. They don't get it. And that's why we need to tell them the gospel of Jesus Christ. So that they can know the true blessings of the Lord God of heaven. Not these, these earthly blessings. Verse 5. Many, O Lord my God, are thy wonderful works which thou hast done, and thy thoughts which are to us word. They cannot be reckoned up in order unto thee. If I would declare and speak of them, they are more than can be numbered. What a, what a glorious verse of praise to the Lord. In Psalm 139, David phrased it this way, and he wrote, How precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God! How great is the sum of them! If I should count them, they are more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with thee. These two passages are a beautiful way of declaring, count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings and see what the Lord has done. How marvelous the Lord God of heaven has been toward each of you. And the wonderful thing is that you cannot really declare one blessing to be greater than another. They cannot, as he uses the words there, they cannot be reckoned up in order unto thee. And that word reckoning, it shows up again in, in Romans chapter 8, but that reckoning, it's, in a, it's basically an accounting firm. You know, and I remember you know, taking accounting back in college a long time ago and, and having to deal with credits and debits and adding things up. And that's the whole idea here. They can't, he's saying that they cannot be reckoned up in order unto thee. In other words, there's not enough accounting paper that you can write down every, if I'm saying it right, credit that God has given to you. There wouldn't be enough paper. And they couldn't be ever added up. And that's how much he has blessed each of us. Because God's thoughts are towards you. He does not just spur of the moment decide how to bless you. He doesn't just suddenly say, you know, we'll be in the store and, and there'll be a, a, a Low Boys t-shirt on the rack. And we'll see that and it's got a shark or it's got a dinosaur. And we'll say, oh, that's what we need to get for our grandson. God doesn't work that way. And then we'll pick it up and buy it. But God doesn't work that way. He already knows the blessing. He didn't just suddenly stumble upon the blessing and say, oh, you know what? I'm going to bless God today and, and do this for him. He's already planned it out and thought it out and knows exactly when the best time it is for me to get that blessing and in the best way for me to get that blessing. Or on the flip side, no, I need to withhold that blessing for right now. Because he is my heavenly father and knows what is best for me. He is also my heavenly king and knows what's best for me. And he knows what's best for each of you. How wonderful that is. His blessings are given to you for your own good and for his own glory. You think about, you know, I have a God that thinks about me. And this is, again, far, 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 far more than just God loved it so crazy about you that he put your picture on his refrigerator. It's so trite. 
because his love is so, so much greater than anything like that. It's so much greater. It's boundless. It can't be measured. It cannot be reckoned as he talks about there in verse 5. Keep your finger here in Psalm 40. Go back now to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 16. You know, and I mentioned earlier how, like, you know, God has the universe in the span of his hand. And when you think about how big the universe truly is, and, you no, know, God is a spirit, so he doesn't have an actual hand, but how big that is. How, how much greater that is. How much more amazing that is. And, 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 and that's just the universe. Then you think about how his love is towards us. It's even more infinite. Look at verse 16. That he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. That Christ might dwell in your, may dwell in your hearts by faith that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us, Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. You think about what he's saying here. He's saying God cannot be outdone by any mere mortal. No earthly father, no mother, no husband, no wife, no child, no friend, no relative, no government, no philanthropist is able to outbless the Lord God. The blessings of God cannot be numbered. They are more than the grains of sand in the world. And when you consider that the Lord God of heaven thinks specifically of you, no government program out there takes you in mind specifically. You think about that. No government program. And why do you think that? And, and the thing is, it's like, that's why, you know, you can have Medicaid and Medicare, but then you have all these supplements, but then you can also have insurance companies that say, well, but you also need this because Medicaid doesn't cover that. Or Why is that? Because the government cannot co cover every need that each and every individual person needs. But God can. But God can. <laughs> you know, their, their, their programs, the government programs, for an example, are tailored for the general population, or they are adjusted for maybe very specific people groups, but they are never adjusted for one person. You won't find some pencil pusher in, in um, the Department of Health saying, okay, this is exactly what Scott Greece needs. They don't care. They don't care. I'm just a number. But God cares. And I'm more than just a number to him. He knows the number of hairs on my head. I am more precious to him than the sparrows. How wonderful God is. And even if you think about it, even if the government were to make a program just for you, it would never ever be as generous as what the Lord has given you in blessings. And when you think about what it's saying there in Ephesians chapter 3, and to, and, uh, oh, where to start? Verse 17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love. In other words, your foundation is built upon Jesus Christ, who is love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height. We can get an idea of this 3D, almost a 4D idea of breadth, length, depth, and height and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge. You think about it at the end of the book of John, and it talks about how, you know, if they wrote down all the works that Christ did just during his three-year ministry here on earth, there wouldn't be enough bookshelves to hold all the books that could be written. And it's that same way with the love of Christ. 
It passes our knowledge. We can't understand it. We can't know it all because we don't have the mind to be able to understand the infiniteness of God. We don't have that mind yet. One day we will, but we don't have that right now. And so it passes all that knowledge. And, and what a great God that we have. Amen. What a great God that we have. Go back to Psalm 40. We're almost done. Psalm 40. Verse 5 again. And look at the last phrase. If I would declare and speak of them, they are more than can be numbered. You know, and I just quoted, you know, that song, you know, count your blessings, name them one by one, you know, the chorus from that. And, and if you tried to truly count every blessing that God has given you, you'd be doing it all day, every day, for the rest of your days. You would die and wake up still reciting the blessings to God. There are that many blessings when you think about it. How can nobody, how can people not want to come to Christ? I don't understand it. When you really think about the love that he has, I'm not even talking about just the benefits of it again. It's the love that he has for us. And it's a true love. Not the love that people talk about today. It's not a squishy love. It's a love that's willing to say, thus saith the Lord, you are a sinner. You're wrong. You need to repent. It's not the love of, oh, that's okay. It'll be all right. No. He wants us to repent. He wants us to ask his forgiveness and look to him and trust in him and walk away from that sin. That's what he calls us to do. And that's what he calls everybody to do. And so we have a wonderful message to share with this world that people need to hear. People are trusting in people, they're trusting in governments, they're trusting in politicians, they're trusting in celebrities, and every single one of them will fail. And they will sin. God never fails. God never sins. And Jesus Christ is what everyone needs. Amen. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, again, I thank you for this time with your word. Lord, I thank you for the things that we see here in Psalm 40 in just the first five verses. What a tremendous God that you are. And Lord, we thank you because you are a God of love and you are a God of wrath. And Lord, I thank you that because of your Son, Jesus Christ, we do not have to bear your wrath. We are no longer under your condemnation. What a blessing that is to know and to trust in. And I thank you, Lord, for that. And Lord, I pray as we go through this week, we would remember these things we've learned this day. We would keep them in our hearts and think on them and then share them and tell them with others. So many need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I thank you, Lord, that you equip us to do that. And I pray that you would guide us and we would be willing to be guided by you each and every day. And these things I pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen.